Welcome everyone to the first video lecture for PT5430, Functional Neurobiomechanical Relationships. In this lecture, we're going to focus on moving through foundational knowledge that is needed for the class as a whole. With any luck, much of this will be a refresher for you. This part of the course is about making sure that we all have a shared language that will aid you in your ability to understand the material that appears later in the class and allows you to talk professionally about patient movement and function. The content of today's lecture is covered in Chapter 1 of the Newman textbook. The foundational knowledge that we'll cover over the next few weeks relates to our goal of understanding human movement. We will draw heavily from three areas of scientific study. The first area that we'll draw from is anatomy, this is the science of the shape and structure of the human body and its parts. Next, we'll draw from biomechanics, a discipline that uses principles of physics to quantitatively study how forces interact within a human living body. And lastly, we'll be drawing upon physiology, the biologic study of living organisms. So, what is biomechanics? Biomechanics is the study of forces that are applied to and exist within the body, as well as the body's reaction to those forces. This definition can be split into two parts, and I've done this by colour coding the two parts in red and blue. The first part of the definition that I've coloured in blue considers forces. This is the study of kinetics. The second part in red considers how the body moves through space. This is the study of kinematics. As DPT students, one of your main aims is facilitating the recovery of function. In a basic science class like this one, you should be interested in how the foundational knowledge that you're going to be encountering is going to relate to function. By function, we mean the ability to do things. In particular, those things that are meaningful to us. Let's look at another definition of biomechanics, this time defined as the application of mechanical laws to living structures. The notion of mechanical laws is admittedly abstract, but mechanical laws have fundamental consequences for understanding function. For example, let's take the most extreme case of functionality. When I'm performing a particular action, am I going to live or am I going to die? What I'm about to say is not a joke. You have a spider, a dormouse, a human, and an elephant that are about to be pushed off the Empire State Building. Which would you rather be? Think about this for a second. Remember, the issue here is whether or not you're going to live or die in one of these scenarios. Are you more likely to die if you're a spider, a dormouse, a human, or an elephant if you're pushed off of the Empire State Building? The definitive answer to this question comes from biomechanics. Mechanical laws relating concepts such as area, volume, mass, forces due to gravity, forces due to drag, all tell us that it's a really bad idea to be an elephant. In our scenario, the spider will be unharmed. The dormouse has the potential to escape with only minor injuries. The human, in the unlikely event that they survive, will never be the same again, and the elephant will quite literally go splat. The study of biomechanics has produced a wealth of scientific knowledge that's spread over a number of well-developed subfields. These include areas of tissue biomechanics, developmental biomechanics, industrial biomechanics, sports biomechanics, and medical or orthopedic biomechanics, to name just a few. Understanding normal anatomy, normal biomechanics, and normal physiology provides a perspective on understanding impaired function and pathology. A common approach in the study of pathokinesiology, that is, the study of abnormal human movement, has been to first ask, what does normal look like? Similarly, in this class, when we look at gait, for example, we will start by considering the characteristics of the gait of young, healthy adults before moving on to considering pathological gait. 
so let's get started reviewing some of the foundational concepts in biomechanics. Kinematics is the branch of mechanics concerned with the motion of objects. In the case of kinematics, when we're talking about motion, we're doing so without making reference to the forces that are causing the motion. The next foundational concept to consider is that of a reference system. You can't talk sensibly about kinematics or kinetics without having a reference system. The commonly used reference frame in biomechanics identifies three cardinal planes. The word cardinal here means of the greatest importance. These planes are defined relative to a person that's standing in the anatomic position, as we see here. These planes are the horizontal plane, the frontal plane, and the sagittal plane. When we start talking about gait patterns later in the semester, we will spend much of our time focused on the sagittal plane and looking at the kinematics or movements in that plane. Here I'm using the word sagittal to let you know that we're talking about patterns of motion of the body when viewed from the side. The commonly used reference system also specifies three axes of motion. We can use these axes as a reference frame for defining both translations and rotations. For example, we can talk movement, we can talk about movement in the x direction, and we can also talk about rotation about the x axis. The origin of the x, y, and z coordinate systems is located at the intersection of the axes. There's two basic types of kinematic motion. On the left, we see an object being translated. That is, the object undergo is undergoing translational motion. On the right, we see a depiction of rotational motion. In a moment, I'll be giving you a more formal definition of the differences between these two motion types. A translational motion is said to occur if all parts of a rigid body move parallel to and in the same direction as every other part of the body. Translational motions can be rectilinear or curvilinear. The word linear means arranged in or extending along a line. Rectilinear motion refers to motion along a straight line. Curvilinear motion refers to motion along a curved line. Walking in a straight line provides a nice example of translational motion. In the picture here, the person starts on the left and ends up on the right. All parts of their body have been transported, and we therefore have, by definition, a translation. When we look closely at this movement, by accurately recording the position of the head as it moves through, sp moves through space, we, do, we don't see rectilinear motion. Instead, we see a vertical oscillation of, as the head raises and lowers by about 5 centimeters. Thus, technically, what we have here is curvilinear motion. In rotational motion, a rigid body moves along a circular path around some pivot point. Here we see a gymnast on a high bar. The first thing to notice is that the translational motion of different body parts is very different. The feet are moving through space much quicker than the pelvis. In contrast to translational motion, we're seeing motion around some point, with different regions of the same body segment not moving through the same distance. We can see an example of rotational motion in elbow flexion extension. This rotational motion follows the red circle drawn here. The center of this circle provides the pivot point and the axis of rotation. We can characterize the motion of an object based upon its kinematics. Basic kinematic descriptors include position, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. Position is a location of an object in space. And by space, I mean within a particular reference system. On this slide, I'm going to be talking about positions in terms of translations. But, as we'll do later in the class, I could be talking about angular position. Here we see a particular reference system. 
we can define the axis for this space, x and y, uh, x and y, and we can define an origin within this space and a position of a point within this space. Position is a vector property in that it characterizes both a magnitude and a direction in space. We can define a position with vector coordinates. Here we define the position of point A using coordinates AX and AY. AX gives us the direction and magnitude that we need to move in the x-axis, and AY does the same for the y-axis. Displacement is the change in position. We'll often, in this class, use the delta symbol, shown here, to stand for a change in a particular quantity. Here we see a displacement from A to B in the graph. Displacement is also a vector quantity. We can represent this with the symbol AB, with an arrow on top. Here we define the displacement from A to B in terms of the change in the X position coordinates and the change in the Y position coordinates. Remember, the delta symbol is referring to a difference or a change in the value. So delta x is the difference in the x values between b and a, which is plus 5. Velocity concerns how quickly a change in position occurs. Here, velocity in the x-axis, represented as v subscript x, can be calculated as the change in position, delta x, divided by the change in time, delta t. Acceleration in the x-axis is represented symbolically as a for acceleration with the subscript x for referring to the x-axis, and concerns how quickly a change in velocity occurs. Distance and displacement are not the same thing. Distance refers only to the magnitude of a displacement. Here we see two displacement vectors, AB and AC. The displacements between A and B and between A and C are different, since they're in different directions. In contrast, in this example, the distance between A and B and the distance between A and C are the same. Distance is a scalar property. It does not care about the direction of motion. Speed is also a scalar property. It refers to the displacement per unit time regardless of direction, or distance per unit time. The next concept that we need in order to talk about movement is that of degrees of freedom. The term degrees of freedom is commonly used to refer to the number of independent directions of movement that is allowed by a joint. Here we see the right glenohumeral, or shoulder joint. This is a joint with many degrees of freedom. Motion around this joint can be described using three axes of rotation and three directions of rotation. Rotations about the medial-lateral axis are considered to be either flexions or extensions. Rotations about the anterior-posterior axis are considered to be either abductions, that's abductions, or adductions, adductions. Rotations about the vertical axis of rotation are considered to be either internal or external. Okay, let's start talking about movement of the human body. Osteokinematics refers to movement of the bones. As we've already said, talking effectively about how the body is moving requires that you use precise language that's shared by the people that you're talking to. Take the case of describing how one limb segment is moving relative to another limb segment. Here we have two cases of two knee flexions that are superficially similar in how the two segments are moving relative to each other, but they are functionally very different. 
In the first movement, the proximal segment, the femur, is not moving through space. It's fixed. And the distal segment, the tibia, is moving relative to it. This might be a person swinging their leg underneath a chair or back heeling a soccer ball. On the right, the situation is very different. The distal segment is fixed and the proximal segment is moving relative to it. This might be a person that is initially standing and then moving into a crouch. Here, our language is further defining our reference system. We're taking a perspective that aids our understanding of the function of the movement. On the left, we would be talking about tibial on femoral movement, or distal on proximal movement, to use a different language. On the right, we would talk about femoral on tibial movement, or proximal on distal movement. Arthrokinematics refers to movement relating to the joints. In arthrokinematics, there are three functional motions, roll, slide, and spin. In roll, multiple points along the rolling articula articular surface make contact with multiple points on the articular surface that's being rolled upon. In slide, a single point on the articular surface that is sliding contacts multiple points on the articular surface that is being slid upon. And lastly, in spin, a single point on one articular surface rotates on a single point on another articular surface. We can use the movements of a tire on a car as an analogy for the three types of motion. In a roll, we have a many-to-many -many relationship, as different parts of the tire come in contact with the different parts of the ground as the wheel rolls along. In a slide or a skid, one part of the tire comes in contact with many parts of the road parts of the road. So when the tire is skidding, this is why we might end up with a board tires on one part of the wheel that was in contact with the ground. The same as when we were talking about osteokinematics a minute ago, in arthrokinematics, it's again important to use precise language to understand the particular motion that's occurring. When we're talking about joint motion, we use the characteristics of joint surfaces, in particular whether an articular surface is convex or concave, in order to clarify what's going on with the motion. Here we see a convex on concave roll slides and spins. The convex articular surface is a moving relative to the concave surface. On the bottom of the screen, we see concave on convex motions. Let's now talk about accessory movements. Accessory movements refer to the slight passive translations that occur in most joints. A careful look at the arthrokinematics of shoulder abduction that we got imaged here, shows that the contracting supraspinatus muscle acts to roll the convex humeral head against the slight concavity of the glenoid fossa. In essence, the roll is directing the osteokinematic path of the abducting shaft of the humerus. A rolling convex surface typically involves a concurrent, oppositely directed slide. The inferior directed slide of the humeral head offsets most of the potential superior migration of the rolling humeral head. These accessory motions keep the joint in place. Accessory motions are required for effective joint functioning. We can see this through a pathologic example. A classic pathologic example of a convex surface rolling without an offsetting slide is shown here. The humeral head is translating upward and impinges on the delicate tissues of the subacromial space. Let's look at the arthrokinematics of the knee. We'll start by considering femoral on tibial knee extension. We're looking at the right leg here. 
the accessory movements of the femur that facilitate joint, congru joint congruency in this motion are anterior roll and posterior slide. As we move towards full extension in this motion, we also see a medial spin of the femur relative to the stationary tibia. This medial spin of the femur is facilitated by the popolitus. Now let's look at tibial on femoral knee extension. We see quite different accessory motions here. Now what we see are anterior roll and anterior slide. We also see a lateral spin of the tibia relative to the femur in the end range of the movement, and this is aided by the line of action of the quadriceps. The difference between these two cases depends upon whether the articular surface that is in motion is convex or concave. For a convex on concave surface movement, the convex member rolls and slides in opposite directions. For a concave on convex surface movement, the concave member rolls and slides in similar directions. This relationship can be used to help remember the types of accessory motions you're likely to see, and is referred to as the convex concave rule. Let's run through the convex concave rule. For a convex on concave surface movement, the convex member rolls and slides in opposite directions. In other words, if the moving joint surface is convex, sliding is in the opposite direction of the angular movement of the bone. For a concave on convex surface movement, the concave member rolls and slides in similar directions. In other words, if the moving joint surface is concave, sliding is in the same direction as the angular movement of the bone. The convex concave rule follows from what needs to happen to keep the articular surfaces aligned. For example, for convex on concave surface movements, without having a slide in the opposite direction, the convex surface will roll off of the concave surface. Within most joints, the two articular surfaces will fit together best in one particular position. This gives rise to the distinction between close-packed positions and loose-packed positions. In a close-packed position, there is maximal joint congruency. That is, the articular surfaces will fit together better. In a close-packed position, joint ligaments and the joint capsules are more taut, and the joint is going to be at its most stable, with only minimal accessory motions being possible. The major joints tend to be more close-packed, when the joint is positioned towards the end of its range of motion and when the joint is an extension. A loose packed position is the position that's typically acquired during joint immobilizations or joint mobilizations in the clinic. We've been talking about kinematics so far, that is about how the parts of the body are moving through space. Let's now switch gears and start talking about kinetics. When we talk about kinetics, we're concerned with forces, the forces that cause motion. A good place to start with kinetics is to think about the actions of muscles and the forces that they produce. We can distinguish muscles based upon the actions that they facilitate. Muscles that are agonists act in a way that corresponds most directly with the movement that is produced. The biceps is the agonist that moves the elbow in deflection. Muscles that are antagonists act in opposition to agonists. For example, in elbow flexion, the action of the triceps will act in opposition to the biceps. Muscles that are synergists cooperate to produce a motion. 
For example, the brachialis and the brachioradialis are synergists of the biceps in elbow flexion, and the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor carpi radialis are synergists in wrist flexion. Muscles produce torque at a joint. A torque is simply a rotational force. Here we see a case where we have an elbow flexion resulting from the contraction of the biceps. We can say that this flexion was caused by the joint torque, the, that is the rotational force acting at the elbow. A torque is calculated as force times distance. If we want to understand the joint torques that are acting at the elbow joint, we need to know the forces that are acting and how far from the point of rotation those forces are acting. The force here that we've illustrated with a red arrow results from the line of action of the biceps pulling up on the radial tuberosity. As the elbow flexes, you will note that the distance from the point of rotation to the line of action of the force vector that we've illustrated with the green line changes. This has important biomechanical consequences. Given our equation here, if we have the same muscle force in both joint positions, we will be able to generate far greater torque when the arm is more flexed and the distance illustrated with the green line is greater. This distance, showed with the green line, is referred to as a moment arm. How do you determine the torque that results from the action of a specific muscle? To understand this, let's consider how we would go about determining the joint torques resulting from the action of the posterior deltoid. The common approach has the following steps. First, we select one of the cardinal planes of motion in which to define our analysis. Here we're going to identify the frontal plane. Next, we draw the line of action, and by that I mean the direction that the muscle is pulling in. We can see the line of action depicted with the red arrow. Next, we mark the point through which the joint axis passes, and this is a point within the humeral head. Lastly, we draw the moment arm. This is the green line. This line is defined by being perpendicular to the line of action and passing through the joint axis. We can go through these same steps to analyse the torques acting in the horizontal and sagittal planes. Now that we have a basic idea of what a torque is and how it's defined, we can consider the difference between internal and external torques. Internal torques are going to be those torques that arise from internal forces. An internal force is produced within the human body, such as the force that's produced by a muscle. External torques are those torques that arise from external forces, an external force is exerted from the outside of the body. External forces could include the forces due to gravity or the resistance imposed by a therapist. Here we see the internal force that is acting at a distance d from the axis of rotation and an external force that is acting at a distance d1 from the axis of rotation. The internal torque is equal to the internal force multiplied by the length of the moment arm D. The external torque is equal to the external force multiplied by the length of moment arm D1. Notice that the internal and external torques have opposing directions. The internal torque is acting to pull the forearm in a counterclockwise rotation, and the external torque is acting to pull the forearm in a clockwise rotation. If the arm is not in motion, that is, 
if it's not either flexing or extending, then this means that the internal forces and the external forces must be balanced. We call this situation being in a state of static equilibrium. As we will see in a couple of lectures time, static equilibrium can make it much easier to calculate internal forces in a biomechanical analysis. There's three basic types of muscle action. Isometric contraction, concentric contraction, and eccentric contraction. Isometric means same length. In an isometric contraction, the muscle remains the same length. And the internal torque that's produced by the action of the muscle is exactly balanced against the external torque acting on the body. In this situation, the body does not move. Concentric means coming to the centre. In a concentric contraction, the muscle shortens as the action unfolds. In a concentric contraction, the torque created by the action of the muscle is greater than the external torque that results from the forces acting on the body. In this case, we see the movement in a direction that is opposite to the direction of the external force. Eccentric means away from the center. In an eccentric contraction, the muscle lengthens as the action unfolds. In an eccentric contraction, the torque created by the action of a muscle is less than the external torque. In this case, we see movement in the same direction as the external force. The most frequently encountered external forces are gravitational forces. This means concentric contractions are frequently anti-gravity movements, where the movement of the body is in the direction opposite to the direction of gravity. Earlier we defined synergists as muscles that cooperate to produce a movement. Muscles acting in a force couple cooperate in a unique way. Even though they're pulling in different directions, they both act to create internal torques that are in the same direction. Here we see that the erector spinae and the sartorius pull on the pelvis in opposite directions. They're both working together, each creating a clockwise internal torque. Levers are mechanisms in which two or more forces act on a rigid body about a fulcrum or axis. There are three classes of levers, defined by the relative locations of the applied force, the resistance or load force, and the fulcrum. We will be thinking about applied efforts in terms of internal muscle forces, and resistances and loads as external forces acting on the body. When it comes to appreciating the function of levers, a key concept is mechanical advantage. Knowing the mechanical advantage informs us about how we can move heavy loads with small forces, or how we can move distal segments quickly. In a first class lever, the applied force, or effort exerted, is on the opposite side of the fulcrum to the load force. To calculate the mechanical advantage for any lever, we divide the length of the external moment arm by the length of the internal moment arm. The external moment arm is the distance of the line drawn from the fulcrum point to the line of action of the external force. As with our earlier calculations, this line is perpendicular to the force vector of the external force. The atlanto-occipital joint is an example of a first-class lever. We see that the centre of mass of the head is forward of the fulcrum point in the atlanto-occipital joint. This explains why our head slumps forward when we fall asleep. Counteracting the external force created by gravity's pull on the head is the action of the head extensors, such as the semispinalis capitis.
Notice that the lengths of the internal moment arm, labelled IMA, and the external moment arm, labelled EMA, are quite similar. We can see in the data box here that the mechanical advantage is calculated to be 1.25. We can also see in this data box how we can estimate the muscle force that must be generated to keep the head upright. In a second class lever, both the external force and the internal force are on the same side of the fulcrum, and the external force is closer to the fulcrum. A wheelbarrow is a second class lever. The load is placed close to the fulcrum, and the effort is exerted, exerted far away from the fulcrum. The actions of a calf raise or standing up on your toes can be interpreted as an example of a second class lever acting on the body. Here the actions of the gastrocnemius, tibialis posterior and soleus muscles act to raise up the body. In this example the external force is the pull of gravity on the centre of mass of the body. We see here that the external force vector falls just behind the axis of rotation located in the first metatarsal head. This creates a short external moment arm. We can see in the data box that we've got displayed on the screen and, with, and that you can also see in the text box in, 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 the, in the textbook that the mechanical advantage is calculated to be four. A mechanical advantage that's greater than one means that a small muscle force can be used to counterbalance a large weight. The pull of gravity on the mass of the body, here 150 pounds, generates a 667 newton external force. With this mechanical advantage we can hold up the body using only 167 newtons of muscle force. This is obviously a key functional benefit of this type of lever. In a third class lever, the external force and the internal force are again both on the same side of the fulcrum, but now the external force is further away from the fulcrum. Holding 90 degrees elbow flexion is an example of a third class lever. The internal moment arm is much shorter than the external moment arm. In the data box that we have here, we see that the mechanical advantage is far below one. This means that a large internal force is required to move a small mass. This functional cost of only being able to move relatively small masses with a third class lever is offset by the functional benefit of being able to move those masses very quickly and through large ranges of motion. To see an interesting clinical example of the relevance of understanding mechanical advantage, I recommend that you read page 24 in your textbook that looks at the application to tendon transfer operations. Let's now move on and start talking about the concepts of stress and strain. Strain is simply a measure of how much an object is stretched or deformed. In other words, how much an object has changed its spatial dimensions. Here we see a spring that is compressed via a force from above. This applied force changes the length of the spring. If the spring is originally 10 centimeters long, and it's 8 centimeters long after being deformed, then the change in length that we've symbolized as delta L is two centimeters. Strain is expressed as a relative change in a dimension. We calculate strain by measuring how much shorter an object gets under compression and dividing that by the extent of the object before the compression. For our 10 centimeter spring, we compress it by two centimeters and the strain is therefore 2 divided by 10, which gives us 0.2, or 20%. Both delta L and LO have units of length, and when we divide them, they cancel each other out, 
Because of this, the physical quantity of strain is what we refer to as a dimensionless quantity, and does not have units. If an object is being squeezed or pulled, the object is stressed by those actions. If the stresses are too great, the material structure of the object will fracture and fail. In more technical terms, when a material is deformed in some way, internal forces are generated in the material to resist that deformation. Mechanical stress is the force per unit area over which a deforming force is applied. The two different cases of the weight of a bowling ball acting to compress springs underneath it illustrate why we need to divide force by area. Imagine here that the springs represent the surface of a material. If all of the force from the weight of the bowling ball is acting in a small area, then the stress experienced by the material, the springs here, will be much greater. Alternatively, if the force exerted by the bowling ball is distributed over a wider area, then the stress experienced by the springs underneath will be lower. We divide by area in this formula because we know that the forces encountered by a material will be lessened if they're distributed over a wider area of the material. Simple stresses include compression, tension, and shear. Complex stresses include bending, torsion, and complex loadings. Many important functional properties of a material are revealed in what's called a stress-strain curve. Here we have the stress-strain curve that we would expect to see for a tendon that has been stretched to a point of mechanical failure. Data like this is typically obtained in experiments in which a sample of tissue, here we see a piece of Achilles tendon in the picture, is gripped at either end and is progressively distended. Each time the two ends of the tissue are pulled slightly further apart, we measure the force that is acting to resist that distension. To calculate the stress, we then divide the measured force by the cross-sectional area of the sample. In our stress-strain curve, strain is on the x-axis and stress is on the y-axis. In our tendon example, stress denotes the internal resistance generated as the tendon resists being deformed, divided by its cross-sectional area. Strain, in contrast, is the percent increase in a tissue's stretched length relative to its original, pre-experimental length. To understand the stress-strain curve, we can start by looking at the bottom left of the graph. This nonlinear or toe region of the graph reflects the fact that the collagen fibers within the tissues are initially wavy or crimped and must be drawn taut before significant tension can be measured. Further elongation, however, shows a linear relationship between stress and strain. The ratio of stress on the y-axis caused by an applied strain, shown on the x-axis, in the tendon is a measure of its stiffness, and this is, also gets referred to as Young's modulus. The clinical term tightness usually implies a pathologic condition of abnormally high stiffness. A tissue that is elongated beyond its physiologic range eventually reaches what's called its yield point. This physical behaviour of an overstretched or overcompressed tissue is known as plasticity. The overstrained tissue has experienced plastic deformation. At this point, microscopic failure has occurred, and the tissue remains permanently deformed. Lastly, we reached the ultimate failure point, the point where the tissue par partially or completely separates and loses its ability to hold any level of tension. The term stiffness has a specific meaning. 
Stiffness is how a component resists elastic deformation when a load is applied. Elastic deformation is underlined in our definition because stiffness is a property of a material that's measured within its elastic region. In other words, it's calculated in the dark blue region that we have displayed on our stress strain curve. So stiffness relates to how a material deforms under load while still being able to return to its original shape once the load is removed. Stiffness is not the same as the strength of a material. Strength is a measure of the stress that can be applied to a material before it permanently deforms, a measure of its yield strength, or, if, or until the point that the material breaks a quantity known as its tensile strength. The units of stiffness are the same as the units of pressure. The SI units, the in other words, the standard units, are newtons per meter squared. The imperial equivalent is pascals. We can understand why stiffness has these units by looking at how it's calculated. Since stiffness is the ratio of stress, which has units of pressure, to strain, which is dimensionless, we end up with units of pressure. To get a feel for stiffness, and what a specific value of stiffness means, here we can see the stiffnesses determined for various materials. The units that we're using here are gigapascals. Starting with the very stiff materials, we see that stainless steel has a stiffness of 200 and coming all the way down to the cheddar cheese sandwich that we took a picture of, that we showed a picture of earlier, we have a, a stiffness of 0 0.00037. To make an everyday clinical connection to our discussions of sti uh, stiffness, here we see some of the mechanical properties of different colors of TheraBand. In the first column, we see the resistance created by each TheraBand when we stretch it to, stri to twice its resting length. In the middle column, we see the differences in thickness across the different uh, the, across the different band types, and finally we see the different stiffnesses. Notice that the change that we see in resistance as we go from the tan all the way down to the gold is much greater than the changes that we see in stiffness. The reason for this is that we have large differences in the cross-sectional area as a consequence of the thickness of the band. And if you remember how stress was calculated, the cross-sectional area is going to come into our calculation. The next mechanical property we're going to look at is stress relaxation. Stress relaxation is a dynamical property. By dynamical, I simply mean that it's a property that changes over time. Stress relaxation captures the observation that if you stretch a material and hold it in a fixed stretched position, that you'll end up seeing a decrease in its resisting force over the time it's stretched. Here we see a graph capturing stress relaxation in tissue. We can look at different parts of the graph. In the blue part of the graph, we see the resistive force that results when we initially stretch the tissue. Once the tissue is stretched, we then hold the tissue in the lengthened position. Lastly, over time, we see that the tissue adapts to the imposed stress and the resistance force in the tissue reduces. This relaxing is what we mean by stress relaxation. In the context of working with tissue therapeutically, after allowing a tissue to relax, the tissue may then be stretched further. Examples of the clinical application of stress relaxation principles include serial casting, Ilizara frames, and the Milwaukee brace for scoliosis. Serial casting is the process in which a series of casts are successfully used to stretch soft tissues for an extended length of time. An Ilizarov external fixator is a ring-like brace. The frame is applied to the outside of the limb and connected through the unbroken part of the bone 
inside the limb. Now let's consider the related concept of creep. We just talked about stress relaxation. Stress relaxation concerns an observation of decreased stress in a material resulting from that material resisting a fixed deformation of the material over time. The material is stretched and held in place and over time we see a decrease in stress. Creep in contrast concerns the slow deformation of a material over time as a result of a fixed load or force being applied to it. Here we see a graph representing creep in a tissue. A fixed load or a stretching force is applied to the tissue. When we do this, we see an initial deformation that we show as the blue line in the graph. If we keep waiting, we see that the tissue keeps adapting, with longer lengths seen over more and more time of the force being applied. Some examples of the clinical application of the concept of creep include spring wire and rubber band braces. Here we see some knuckle benders and skeletal traction using weights. The next concept for us to look at is fatigue. Fatigue refers to a process in which a material can become weakened from experiencing multiple repetitive loading cycles. This process can lead to mechanical failures at magnitudes of stress below the ultimate strength of the material. Fatigue is seen in both non-biological and biological tissues. Examples of fatigue in biological tissues include stress fractures, bursitis that occurs when bursi become inflamed, tendonitis, and most overuse injuries. The mechanical property of viscosity sits behind some important characteristics of biological tissues that we'll be discussing next lecture. Viscosity is most easily understandable in terms of the motion of a fluid. When motion occurs in a fluid, interactions between the molecules in the in the, in, within the fluid produce forces that act to resist motion. The key characteristic of viscosity is that the resistance encountered depends upon the velocity of the deformation that's occurring. In the picture here, we see a person moving their hand through water. If they do this slowly, they will experience minimal resistance. If they do this quickly, the resistance force will increase dramatically. An everyday example of viscosity can be seen in a door damper. You've all seen these devices at the tops of doors. They make it impossible to slam a door. The faster you move the door, the more resistance that these devices create. If someone describes a material or a tissue in the body as viscoelastic, it means that that material has both viscous properties and elastic properties. Most biological tissues are best characterized as being viscoelastic. They are elastic in that the resistance forces in the tissues increase linearly with how much it's stretched, and they're also viscous in that the tissues will resist higher forces if the force is applied quickly. Viscosity is a property that's often mistakenly overlooked in thinking about the function of tissues. For example, tissues are often tested only at one speed. Okay, that completes our first lecture on the basics of biomechanics. Your goal when you're reviewing this material is to make sure that you know the meaning of all of the concepts that we've covered today. These concepts will turn up multiple times throughout the class.